and there are the, these many different stories that are associated with grave markers. I mean, they're, they're tangible objects. You can walk into the burial ground and sort of stand face to face with history. Historians Mark Nunnestide and Richard Veit are experts on New Jersey's cemeteries and tombstones. Now they've written a book about the stories these silent monuments can tell. Many of the earliest cemeteries, such as this one here in, in Elizabeth, the Elizabeth Presbyterian Churchyard, it's established in the 1660s, but the first grave markers that survive are from the 1680s, and it's really not until after 1700 that we see a lot of markers. So most people probably had either informal markers, maybe wooden markers, or perhaps no markers at all. I think Elizabeth is important because this was sort of a cultural center in early New Jersey. So you had a number of artisans here, craftsmen, who produced the stones. So there are probably more uh, early markers here than almost anywhere else in the state. Here lieth the body of Miss Sarah Woodruff, wife of John Woodruff, who departed this life the 3rd of June, 1727, and the 62nd year of her age. Well, it's one of the most, one of the more interesting stones in the grave marker because you have all of the different Puritan designs up at the top. So you've got a skull with crossbones very nicely carved. You have an hourglass. These little birds may be peacocks, which would have been a sign uh, for, of eternity for Puritans. And then these things, they look like waves are probably actually flames licking the whole picture. So really speaking to the shortness of life and concern for one's soul, it's really a, a masterpiece of carving. Some of these colonial era masterpieces are now being restored. We're packing the areas with cotton after we clean where the stone is separating from the marker. Um, because, you know, we're about to lose, we were about to lose a lot of this lettering. So what we did is we cleaned out the area we pack it with cotton so that we can inject a lime and sand-based grout, and um, that stabilizes the area. Now you're able to, to pretty much see that all of these are, are now sound. And we will fill a, a mortar that's colored to match the stone, and that'll um, hide the repair. And this was, um, a lot of these pieces had fallen, um, so this is one that we will try to reattach. This was a world in the 18th century without a lot of public art. There were some paintings, but most people weren't regularly exposed to art. And cemeteries were a place where they could go and they could see art. And the art had a meaning and it told a story. I mean, it conveyed a message. Skulls and crossbones on them, hourglasses, which sort of speak to how short life often was in the colonial time period. And then later markers here are equally interesting because we get uh, angels or cherubs on top of the markers, which reflect different religious sensibilities, more about salvation than about mortality. And the markers continue to change. So they really provide sort of a reflection of society and how, it, how it's evolving and changing through time. The 19th century brought still more changes. The Victorians designed entirely new, elaborate park cemeteries set on the outskirts of towns and cities, like Harley Cemetery in Camden, where poet Walt Whitman is buried. Part of it is a reaction to the colonial uh, church burial grounds, which by the early 1800s had uh, become very crowded. Um, they were often associated with uh, unsanitary conditions in society, especially in urban areas. And uh, the reaction to that was to design burial grounds differently. They're well landscaped, uh, they have winding paths, uh, elaborate plantings. They become uh, what we call garden cemeteries and they're part of the rural cemetery movement and the markers became more monumental. In Mount Pleasant Cemetery in Newark, there's a sculpture of a young girl who died after a dancing party. And there are marble obelisks. It's a popular uh, style that is revived in the 1830s and 40s uh, based on um, a re-interest in Egyptian architecture uh, at that time period. Uh, in fact, there's some early vaults here at Mount Pleasant Cemetery where the facade is an Egyptian revival designs, uh, which were popular, uh, again, in the, the early decades of the 19th century. This plot is the fireman's plot at uh, Mount Pleasant Cemetery in Newark. Um, it was created in 1888, and uh, many rural garden cemeteries from the 19th century had plots for fraternal organizations and for various groups. 
what's unique about this plot is the the overwhelming use of fire motifs the uh, hoses here as part of the gate uh, you can even see the ladder and a pike uh, that have been uh, design elements incorporated into the gate and the uh, fence posts are former uh, fire hydrants from Newark from the 19th century The stories found in New Jersey cemeteries are endless, from the fabulous mausoleum built by John Dryden, founder of Prudential Life Insurance, to the anonymity of numbers without names in a Trenton State Prison graveyard. New Jersey cemeteries are great. I mean, it's obviously a small state, so it's sort of a manageable thing to study, but the state is really diverse sort of from region to region. The grave markers down by Philly are very different than what we have in sort of the area closer to New York City. All sorts of ethnic cemeteries from the 19th and 20th century, so it makes it a lot of fun to study because there's sort of something for everyone here. Personally, I think it, it highlights how diverse our state is. Uh, we are a diverse state today. Uh, we have historically been a, a diverse state and uh, that diversity speaks very well in, in the burial ground.